going all right in here? No technical problems? Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you're not. Okay, good. We'll have a good meeting. Hello. Whoa. Wow. Sorry. Don't eat the mic. Whoa. At the last meeting, I was at somebody did a literal mic drop by accident, and that was that was pretty exciting too. So I was just going to say, you know, hello. This is the routing area open meeting. If you're just hanging out and back to chat with your friends, maybe go outside to chat with your friends. If you're here for the routing area open meeting, take a seat. Dan, Rob. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, welcome to the routing area open meeting. We've got 90 minutes for our agenda, and I think we don't have 90 minutes worth of agenda. So hopefully we'll get you all a little bit of time back in your afternoon, which we all could probably could use. Um, we have a note well. It's the same note well you've seen before and since. Um, you all agreed to it. Uh, it has important information, um, including about things like everything you do here may go into the public record and um, what you're uh, agreeing to do with respect to intellectual property that you may know about and things like that. If you haven't read these documents, they're very boring and very important and you should read them at least once. And those of you who are working chairs are also used to, working group chairs are also used to telling this to all of your working groups. Um, I swear I took out that five minutes thing there, but I guess I put it back in by accident. Um, yeah, we're, like I said, we have plenty of time, so I'm, we're not gonna try to stick to very specific time slots. So we do have time for this to be an interactive session, which would be nice. Um, so, Scribe selection, I, I've noticed that um, there was a lot of talk on, um, I don't know if it's the attendees list or the tools list about how um, robots can do all of our scribe work for us now. There's the transcription that's running up the side that's getting my words fairly accurately. So um, if anybody feels like taking notes for us, that would be nice. Um, but I don't think we're gonna hold the meeting up otherwise. Um, so if you do feel like taking notes for us, you know where the shared notepad is. Um, this is our agenda. If anybody feels like they want to bash at it, uh, Tony points out that I have the wrong name next to TVR. Uh, Ed will be presenting, sorry for the error. Um, let's see. Um, we will have a, any other business after the, you know, things that are on here. So if something comes to mind during the meeting, we can take it at the end. Um, yeah, so state of the area, we um, have closed one of our working groups, SFC, thank you for all your work. Um, we have two working groups that will be closing soon. Babel will be closing soon and so will RAW. Uh, RAW's work will be moving, um, the remaining work will be moving into DetNet. 
Um, and we don't have any new working groups or any new boss at the moment, which is okay with me, but um, because we had a lot of action over the last few meetings. And we had a, wanted to say a few words about author lists and document quality. And I think Andrew is going to talk to those. So um, yeah, thanks for all being here. Um, author lists. Um, this is something that's come up, you know, a fair number of times over the last while. Um, and particularly in the last couple of weeks, I think the IESG has been looking at author lists quite closely. The current documents actually say there's a five author limit. And if you're going over the five author limit on documents, you need to actually justify it. We've had a couple of instances where the justification has come down to, well, because the authors want it. That is not a justification. Um, it, it simply isn't. So what we are now saying is that if you go over the five author limit, um, if you can't really give a solid justification for it, then it's going to come down to appoint an editor and move the people to the contributors. And we're going to get pretty strict about this. Um, the IESG used to be pretty strict about this, and then it wasn't. Um, but we are now returning to a position where we really need to avoid these really long author lists, et cetera, and there needs to be justification. So that's just a note to everybody to please be aware of it. I see. AC Lindum Lavin. You know, I got a document right now that was the merging of a number of different uh, techniques for ISIS fast flooding. And all that I can say, all of the uh, offers contributed. It's not, it hasn't gone to the ISG yet, but it's in working group last call. I really don't. Note what you I say said you're going to be strict, but you don't give any reason why you're going to be strict but, but, on this. I mean, I mean, I'm going to continue. If I think there's going to be longer offer lists, I'm going to continue to put it in the Shepherd's report that all these people have contributed and list their contribution and and note what I said about sufficient okay. justification. And if you can say these are the people who have contributed and here's what they've contributed, that constitutes a sufficient okay, justification. Okay, okay. So why, how is this a change? Danny? How is this any change to policy that we've always had? It isn't a change. So, so what you described as best practice, not everybody has been following best practice. Okay. Um, and it's been devolving. Okay. Um, okay. So if, okay. If, I'm, okay, I'm fine. I'm, I'll settle down. If now. you can point to like paragraphs that like, this person wrote, nah, you know, like yeah. these lines. That that's good. That's great. We, we have, you know, I know. A Andrew was not joking. I've seen them where they don't fit on one page. I know well, what you're talking there, about. There's there's that, but we've also gotten documents, you know, recently where literally the justification provided was because the authors wanted it that way. That that's not oh, okay. that's no, not a no, paraphrase. I agree. That's a quote. I agree. Okay. Yeah. So that's just the quick note about author lists. To please be aware of it. Um, yeah. Oh, and if you are getting up to the microphone, please put yourself in the queue. Um, it just makes it easier. Um, then we get to the topic of document quality. Now, this is always an interesting topic. What we as the, as the ADs kind of feel is that we're prepared to commit that if documents have technical issues, we will bounce the documents a lot more quickly to avoid a long cycle, rather return them, get the issues fixed, and we proceed, it speeds up the documents. That's on the technical issues side. We've also been getting a lot of documents recently where the grammar, the spell checks, etc., are not good at all. And what we are going to be saying now is that if we start finding that, we will return the document to the working group as insufficiently reviewed, insufficiently edited by the working group, not properly checked. When it comes back to us, it speeds it up. And if the working groups do a solid job, look, we understand that a lot of the documents, you know, if you've got non-native English speakers, for example, there can be mistakes, etc. But you've got a working group. The working group's job is to ensure that the document that comes to the ADs 
is of sufficient quality. And if people want shorter queues and shorter turnaround times, it takes a lot of time for an AD to work through a long document with a lot of problems. So we're going to get a lot more strict about document quality as well. You know, it's, it's been a long time since I saw documents being kicked back to working groups. Um, it does not happen often. I suspect you're going to start seeing it a lot more if people are not, you know, more diligent on those reviews and on the quality before they come to the ADs. Not because we want to be difficult, but because people are saying queues are too long, it's taking us too long. This is the one way to sort it out, to actually reduce the the amount of time it takes to move a document. Yeah. Jeff. Jeff, I was going to repeat something from the routing chairs meeting because not everybody was uh, in that meeting. Flagging stuff is basically needing language review is a good thing because it means that uh, when somebody's ready to do tech review, their brain's not short circuiting because of the grammar. Um, and these things can be flagged separately. The thing I'm strongly suggesting to everybody is that if we're going to have process for this sort of thing, this isn't something that anybody inside of a specific working group has to own. You know, it doesn't have to be a directorate. It can literally be every hand, set of hands that you know, thinks they do OK in English. But to make that easy, we need to have a workflow that the patches can flow in nicely. And doing that against ID NITS markup is pain in the ass. I'm going to strongly suggest to the ADs to consider making it process that if you're going to flag this sort of thing, make them stick it into GitHub. You know, I know it's an optional piece of process right now, but it means that you could take grammar patches very easily and then incorporate them very easy and get review on it very easily. I think that's definitely something we can have a discussion about, John. And I'd, I'd probably rather discuss that further over beer than try to do it right now at the mic. But, um, you know, thank you for the suggestion. I, you know, high, high order bit being like, if we can use tooling to, to get our cycle times down, this is a good thing. Agreed. Um, Sue. Sue. In my professor hat, we use Grammarly as a platform to test grammar and spelling. Is that an acceptable one? Um, sure. I, I don't want to be like, you know, mandating a particular commercial tool from the chair here, but absolutely. I actually also use that and find it to be fairly adequate. Yeah, just, just one note. I, I also use that a fair bit. I, I would say that one of the things to, to keep in mind with all of those that I found is that some of those tools do also kick up a lot of false positives. So, you you know, it, it comes and goes. But, yes, they help. Um, and um, we're not going to mandate any tool. All we're asking is that people, you know, do the checks properly. Right. Th this is not like a case of your, your document must lint completely clean under some particular linter. It's just a case of um, if we, you know, if it doesn't pass the smell check when it, when it gets sent to the AD, we may send it back instead of hanging on to it for a long time. Um, if Sue wants the, to respond. The purpose of Grammarly question was it's one ruler that we might use that you're happy with. That's all. Tony. I was also going to suggest dropping it into MS Word or chat GPT. You can also proofread. Lots of alternatives, guys. There is no excuse. And, and this is strongly, strongly recommended if English is not your first language or even if it is. Tara. Um, from my end, I just want to say that I think if, if the ITF wants to invite like more people from the wider world to be able to participate, I know that automated tools can help sometimes, but I do have my doubts about like large language models. Sometimes they can introduce things that were unintended. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do want to remind that like people who can help with copy editing do exist in the larger world. And I think maybe that's something the IETF should consider as a, as a service to help like people by contracting someone, some people to help uh, people who are drafting 
uh, reports? So, so I will say that, you know, we have, you know, an extremely good professional staff in the RFC editor, but then, you know, they come in at the end of the process. I mean, I guess if you're saying we, we could have contracted people at the front end of the process too, um, it's, we can take it back to the IESG and talk about it. Um, it's, it's a worthy suggestion. Thank yeah, you. That, that was my Thank you. Dan, you didn't put yourself in the queue and plus Andrew wants to respond to this one. So hang on a second. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, I think one of the other things just to be aware of, and this is due to no fault of the editors or anything else, but if you allow grammar errors to go to the RFC editor, etc., keep in mind that they are not the working group. They do not have the technical, the deep technical knowledge. And there have been one or two instances where an attempt to fix grammar by an editor like that outside of the working group that doesn't have explicit knowledge can fundamentally change the meaning of a document. And that can be a problem. So you, yes, the RSC editor does a great job on fixing a lot of minor things, but you've got to be careful of that risk because the in-depth detailed knowledge of what the document is meant to say sits in the working group. And that's why we prefer the working group to, you know, really do the checks in the working group. Uh, yeah, Bogdanovich wanted to raise the same issue because when you're drafting the first document, you really want to make sure that the meaning is well understood, that larger group of people can understand what is written without having ambiguities in that document. And, um, me being a person whose English is not the first language, I have now a problem when I write in my mother tongue, I write something that I do literal translation from English, and then it's, uh, I'm sending a very ambiguous message and people don't know exactly what I'm meaning. So this is one important part that if you wanna have standards document that we put in the effort as the authors to make sure that the, that the document is well understood in the language that is is being written, not in the language that we are thinking, you know, in our head. Yeah, just just one other comment on that. Um, you know, one of the things that I found in the reviews that that I've done, when I get to a point where I look at a document and I go, maybe I'm misunderstanding this. One of the things that I have done is go to my fellow ADs or other implementers that I know and go, I'm not going to comment on how I'm interpreting this. Read it and tell me how you're interpreting it. If I see that my interpretation, their interpretation, and then a third person's interpretation are three different interpretations of the document, that's a really good sign that we have a problem because it's going to lead to three different broken implementations. So I take your point, you know, you, it, it's got to be clear because if you are getting multiple different interpretations of the same document, that's not good for standards. <clears throat> so I, j just one comment on that. So I, I, I don't want to give the impression that we, we're just being picky here. We're doing this for a reason. And um, I can, based on uh, Andrew's point, I can think of two documents in the last couple of months where we three ADs have had a discussion about a particular point in there and all three of us understood it differently. So this isn't something that Andrew's made up. This is something we've actually seen in two documents. So, so really the ask is, look, what you really want is for the ADs to be looking at these documents from a technical standpoint. But if we're spending lots of time trying to figure out what the document's actually trying to say, then you're not getting the service from the ADs that you as a community actually need and want. So, so that's really why we're bringing this up as opposed to we're just grumpy today. Uh, I think AC Lindham oh. got... <clears throat> Lab in. That's a good point about the RFC editor possibly uh, correcting it wrong. We had a case where it wasn't a grammar thing, but it was where a non-well-known acronym was not the first instance was not expanded and the RFC editor picked the wrong one. It went 
you know, it was really late in the process. Nobody saw it, and it ended up to being an errata. Right. No other comments, right? Have you ever used this thing before? I guess it works. It doesn't just shut, it does remove the slides. So just before Adrian starts, so we, we've asked a couple of working groups to give us a, uh, a summary of where they're at. There's something that we'd like to do as ADs in these meetings, just to get awareness of what some of the uh, other working groups in the routing area are doing that you may not be familiar with. Um, and uh, Adrian has the, uh, the task for CATS. The short straw. Um, my co-chair, uh, Pong Liu, is in uh, China um, awaiting a, an appointment for a visa. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, computing aware traffic steering. Uh, a little history. Um, there's been uh, a number of drafts kicking around on this sort of topic. Uh, there were some uh, downcast things uh, and compute first networking, which all got bundled up and renamed as computer aware networking. Uh, and uh, that boffed in March 2022, so um, four cycles back. Um, and then um, presented. Uh, a little bit sort of uh, scattergun in um, in the ITF in Philadelphia. Um, and then uh, the ADs created a mailing list, uh, the routing ADs created a mailing list uh, to start talking about that. Another boff in London in uh, November 22, uh, where there was pretty clear interest uh, in the room in doing the work. However, the, mo the meeting was very unfocused, and I think uh, they only got sort of a quarter of a way through the agenda, uh, but managed to fill the time with, uh, with discussions. Uh, a lot of internet drafts got written, um, and uh, coming out of the BOF, a, a draft charter was uh, put together and, uh, and pushed around the community for re review. We renamed to CATS um, because of controller, uh, uh, controller area networking, which um, is probably prior art. Um, and then at that point, the AD said, OK, we, we've boffed enough. We've got a charter. Let's just um, go and form a working group. So we had our first meeting in Yokohama um, several days after the working group was formed. Um, which was kind of fun. Uh, some old drafts were renamed and uh, and posted, so they just changed the can to cats. Um, right, what's the scope? Uh, services tend to get spawned in multiple places on multiple servers at different locations, and a single server may include multiple instances of a service. I hope that's not a surprise to anyone. Um, we sort of say, if you've got a computing platform, so your service is a bit more than just look up this piece of data or, 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 or return this web page, but it's actually doing some processing. We're calling that a compute service. Uh, and the performance experienced by a client of a compute service is obviously going to depend on the network on the way to the server that's providing the service and the capabilities and load on that server at the, at the moment. Um, so the, the, the question that Katz is asking or trying to answer is how can the network edge steer the traffic between clients of the service uh, and the sites that offer the service? 
so the, the two highlighted things there are, are kind of important. Um, many previous systems, you're making the choice of, of compute server either at the, at the host, you're doing some lookup, getting an address, sending your request off to that address, or somewhere in the network, your request is, is going through a load balancer and being fanned out accordingly. What this is trying to do is say, the client says, this is the service I want, sends it off. And when it comes into the network, which is probably typically a, a Metro Edge node, um, that node is gonna say, right, now I'm going to make the selection of the right server or service provider and uh, route towards it. Um, so before the working group does anything related to solutions, uh, it's got to do some basic groundwork. And that's probably frustrating to a lot of people because uh, of two things. Firstly, they've got their pet solution they want to push forward and, and go. But also, it's a lot easier to understand the problem space if you've got a, uh, at least a, a kite flown about a protocol solution, because you can, then, you can then look at it and understand the problem. Well, tough. We're not chartered to work on solutions. Uh, we have to do groundwork. Um, that's the list of, of the things that the charter says we should be on. But only one of those is explicitly identified as going towards RFC, and that's the framework and architecture. It's possible that the others will be such wonderful documents. We want them as historic RFCs just to, to say um, this is what we were thinking, but it's not actually necessary as, a, as an outcome. Uh, Dan, I'm going to take you at the end, take all the questions at the end. Yeah. Um, so it's really, 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 really early days for the working group. Um, you know, we've just had four, uh, four months uh, and um, we haven't yet have a, had our second meeting. That's uh, tomorrow morning. Um, but because some of the work's been around for a while, it, it looks a bit lumpy. You can sort of look at the working group page and see all these drafts, and it's not quite clear which ones are latest thought and which ones are, are, are old stuff. Um, we've just adopted uh, a, a draft for problem statement, use case, and requirements all packaged together. That draft is uh, fairly rough still, but it's a good enough starting point that we can actually um, beat a bit more sense into it. Uh, tomorrow's agenda has got uh, some terminology stuff where Med is going to try and persuade us to, um, to all say the same thing when we mean the same thing. Um, we're going to look at the use cases and see whether we are converging on a, on a set of use cases that are reasonable. Uh, the requirements that come out of those use cases. And then we're going to start talking about metrics. And the metrics we have to talk about are how do you report on your ability to do compute processing in a way that is standard? Um, I don't know I need to go through this again unless you really want to know what it's all about. Uh, the point is that halfway down, the local network edge is steering traffic to the remote network edge, um, which then may also steer it on a little bit further to a particular service instance. And the choice is being made on service requirements, capabilities and load of the server, capabilities and load of the network. So it's sort of traffic engineering plus um, server selection. The use cases that we have um, on the table, we're still firming up. Um, there's quite a lot of them that have been listed uh, and further ones are coming up. Uh, for example, we have a draft tomorrow on uh, uh, the large AI requirements um, for processing on, on multiple processors. Um, <coughs> 
you can look at this list and decide that some of them are realistic and some of them are far in the future. And what, what I hope we'll do is get down to a few killer use cases that really focus us. Um, obviously not a complete list that we want to get to um, because that would be crazy. Um, there are some differences, but a lot of commonalities in our use cases. Um, they, they will all have different requirements from the network in terms of latency and volume of traffic and so on. Uh, but they all need to move data and have um, some kind of processing with a response. Um, so the requirements are very much work in progress, but we see these four things. Uh, you need to mark the traffic as, as targeting a group of service instances. So you're doing some kind of selection to identify what service it is you want uh, and what type of um, uh, service function you want um, executed. Uh, and there's been a suggestion to use an Anycast address for this. It's a suggestion, we'll see. Um, then we need to collect information from the network about topology and metrics. Um, we already do this, of course, um, quite, been doing it for a few years. We may need to bolster that to get more information about latency and other performance uh, in the network. But we, we pretty much know how that's done. We need to collect information from the service instances uh, their locations, which is effectively their membership of this Anycast group that you might be targeting, uh, the capabilities uh, and the loading. So that's the metrics that was still up in the air and we need to do a lot of work on. Um, we also need to know um, some service demand requirements. Uh, so when you make the service request, do you need it quickly? Is it big? That sort of thing. Uh, and we need a way of batching the packets into service requests. Um, I can't really, I, I've been using the term transaction to try to explain this, but clearly you don't want a multi-packet um, service request getting sprayed out across different service instances because then nobody will know the whole story. But you don't need to bind all of the transactions between one client uh, and a service function always to the same service instance. You can move them around per transaction. Uh, here's a pretty picture. Uh, the most important part of this picture is the little red box that says this is not consensus. Okay, this is in a, um, in a first version of a uh, an ind individual draft. Uh, it's a nice picture, um, but uh, it might not go that way at all. What it sort of shows though, uh, if you read it from the left, is uh, an edge site with clients um, that uh, sends some traffic into uh, an edge router that is making a decision somehow and selecting to steer the traffic towards a remote service instance. And then the other boxes here are, are the pieces that collect the information from the network collect the information from the service instances about their uh, capabilities and loading and channel that back together to some functional blob that makes path selection choices. I believe I did that faster than I intended. So good. Uh, Mr. Bogdanovich. Uh, so this is a very interesting area and it uh, is a nice layering on, on the DeckNet because these two things are uh, combined. So in the OT world, operational technologies, this is a new thing that I learned in the past few years, there are vendors who are looking to enable industrial automation and now they're looking, before they were embedding all the logic on a single uh, machine that was doing everything locally and now they are looking how to uh, have a distributed software load across different layers within their 
enterprise domain. So one of the things for them is they want to keep everything within their enterprise domain. They are not interested in any multi-domain solutions. They're saying, we need something simple. I go and talk to them, it has to work within a campus or a smaller environment, like in a factory, warehouse, but it has to work very reliably and that I know what I'm, what I'm sending where. The other part is also that they are, that they will, what they're looking into it is the, um, that multiple devices will work on the same thing, it, on the same end product. So it's a, they're looking for a solution for mobile vel welding machines. When those mobile welding machines are working together on large sheets of metal and they are sending back for QA x-ray pictures uh, to verify if the welding has been done, welding spot has been done correctly. And then they are comparing them uh, if three or four or five of those machines have done it correctly. So it's like a hierarchical stage what they are doing. And if we could have some input from the operational technology vendors, what problems are they facing? I know a few, but they're coming and asking those like, you know, very specific, how can I have deterministic connectivity that my application can, uh, that, that my service can distinguish between data, if I lose the data, will uh, cause a catastrophic event, it will cause a failure, or who cares? Because that's how they're dividing and they're trying to process the data in a certain uh, amount of time because they want to improve their productivity. So they can say, as long as I know in what time frame I'm working with, this is fine, but it has to be sort of deterministic. Yeah, I think that's interesting with relation to this picture because there are two things. One is that blue network could be an enterprise that might be running DebtNet. And the other is that you might collapse the client box with the, um, with the ingress edge router, collapse the functionality. Um, so I've got two asks of you. One of them is help us find the right people to talk to from cats. Uh, and the other is think about writing two thirds of a page of use case description to go in our use case document. So some of the companies are like Schneider Electric, Siemens. Those are the companies who are making the operational technologies. Samsung is making operational technologies um, that they are a bunch of others, but uh, they are the ones who know that what problems they are facing. Um. Yeah, just two two quick comments. Um, firstly, in response to that, if you can bring organizations like that into the IETF to bring more thoughts and perspectives, I think um, it would be really welcome. You know, uh, we always like to have more variety in the IETF. So, you know, encourage them to come along, you know, be a good thing. Um, Adrian, wearing no particular hats. Um, I wanted your kind of thoughts on one of the things that I've seen with CAT is that there seems to be a fair amount of ambiguity in the community about what represents CATs versus what represents APN and where they mix together, etc. And I wanted to kind of hear from you whether or not you've kind of seen a bit of confusion there and how you see dealing with that going forward, et cetera, because it is something that has kind of come to me a fair bit in recent times, and I just wanted your thoughts on it. Yeah, so there's, there's marking that has to go on in both cases, marking packets to say what... <clears throat> oh, yeah, it's the landmine I just trod on. <laughs> the landmine I, yeah, <laughs> the landmine I just trod on was the one, it was the word application, okay? Um, so marking the packets to indicate what... Um, what sort of processing stream they're part of. Um, 
so that they can get treated appropriately. APN is about processing those packets, looking at that information within the network um, to make um, per hop behavior type actions. Uh, CATS is about looking at that information at the edge of the network in order to do a, one, a one time only steer, which is to a destination, possibly on a traffic engineering path. Uh, CATS is only interested in those compute type network functions. APN, I think, is more interested in um, a different type of granularity of I'm a voice call, I'm a augmented reality thing. Um, but they're both sort of thinking about, well, what I'm doing needs low latency compared to normal traffic, or what I'm doing is very big burst of traffic compared to, to normal traffic. So there, there, there is, there's a similar feeling, but I think that the um, architectural solution is very different. You should also have asked about Alto, or I should have mentioned, Alto should have been on this. Um, uh, so Alto is this thing in the uh, transport area, um, which uh, operates as a server that collects information from the network and the client, normally shown as being located at the host, says, well, I know what I want to do. I'll go and ask Alto for the best location to go to and possibly the best way to get there, uh, given the things that I want to do. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a clear kind of similarity, except that's largely speaking uh, client-based and this is edge-based. Um, what we're going to do is uh, see whether there's any commonality in metrics um, for compute, because Alto may want to suck metrics from the network, uh, and we obviously need to suck metrics from the network. So Adrian, I, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, you mentioned earlier that CATS as currently chartered is not to work on solutions, and, and I think that was a very deliberate thing that we did because um there is a lot of things out there and people that um we, we we wanted to avoid a rush to build something without actually understanding what the heck it is we're trying to solve and what i really like about this working group is that the charter says essentially let's let's actually figure out what it is we want to solve and then we'll start talking about solutions so um, what I'm hoping to come out of this is a, you know, is a nice architecture that understands what are the metrics that we need, how, why are they useful, what are the use cases, and um, that's exactly what it's chartered to do. So I just wanted to reiterate that, and if I got that wrong, please correct me. No, that's, that's my understanding. I mean, uh, obviously, people are writing drafts, and, and, and bless them, but um, we're not finding any space in our meetings to talk about solutions. And if the mailing list gets clogged up with people talking about solutions, they'll be uh, dampened. Uh, I'm hoping that there's a lot of technology out there already. Uh, we've heard DetNet, um, the IGP has moved stuff around quite nicely inside the network. Um, and as John knows, everything can be done with BGP. Uh, we we may find that we only need just little deltas on top of existing protocols to do everything. But until we know what it is we're trying to do, it's it's going to be a bit hard to guess. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Can also ask me to 
Ronald Infeld, Dutch guy with a strange name or strange guy with the Dutch name, whatever you prefer. I'm uh, a co-chair of the mobile ad hoc networking group. We now, there's now three of us, I'm coming to that. But first a refresher of what uh, the Monet Working Group is. It's about mobile ad hoc networks that involves wireless communications. Everything is moving. The nodes are moving. There may be obstacles, obstacles to the movement or obstacles to the propagation. The obstacles to the propagation might even be moving. And all those movements are neither predetermined nor predictable. And uh, this is a generic node model, although some of the protocols in there are specific. But uh, we distinguish between a router, which does not has to have to be uh, a hardware box. It could be a, a software function, because usually um, the radios that are attached to that router have uh, such low capacity or the, or the links that they are using have such low capacity that the uh, number of packets per second can easily be handled by a, a software router. And then we have the hosts that run the applications and uh, these are attached to the router. And there may be multiple uh, radios connected to a router. And the routers run a mobile ad hoc networking protocol between them or among them. Uh, in this case, uh, the one standardized uh, protocol from uh, the working group uh, is shown, which is uh, OLSR version 2, RFC 7181. Uh, I always like to remind people from the routing area that there are three standardized, uh, as far as I know, three standardized link state routing protocols uh, in the uh, in the IGF. So uh, next to uh, OSPF and ISIS, there's also OLSR version two. Um, yeah, this is the most uh, um, generic model, but in practice, um, things may be collapsed into, for instance, a single uh, handheld device that is running the applications, doing the routing, and also includes uh, some form of wireless communications. Where are we? Well, um, oh. I will have to say one more thing about this. Uh, because we, uh, we have cases where we have the radios and the router as uh, being on separate platforms, there's a protocol uh, between them, it's local. It's only local communication between the radio and the router. It's called DLAP, Dynamic Link Exchange Protocol. The basic spec is RFC uh, 8175, and there are a number of extensions. And uh, DLAP is what most of the effort of the working group has been spent on in recent years. Um, but now we are at the point that we uh, want to recharter re because there are a few things on our current charter that are dead ends. I'm coming to that later. And some other things that we want to take on but are not covered by the current charter. Um, and then there's the, as you have just heard, the Babel, Babel work group is closing down, but there is always uh, a need to be able to do maintenance and extensions to Babel, and maybe even some more new work. So that's going to be folded into the new charter of the Monet Working Group. Um, we had a session yesterday. Um, we had two presentations on new work that would fit potentially in the new charter. Um, still to be decided, we take them up once we have the new charter, or whether they will be on the new charter. And then we were going to have a, 
uh, discussion. We started the discussion on uh, the new charter, but uh, we had started a bit late and uh, uh, the one hour that we had was up before uh, we could really get into the uh, rechartering discussion. So that has to be initiated on the mailing list and then we will have an interim uh, in uh, six or seven weeks for now. Um, then we hopefully before uh, the Prague meeting, we will have a new charter. Um, starting point will be a long list of potential items. We have to uh, bring that down probably uh, in discussions with our AD to something manageable. Um, what is manageable will also depend on the horizon of the new charter. The last uh, charter, uh, the last charter revision took place in 2016. So uh, we've been going for a pretty long time without rechartering. Um, because Babel is going to close, uh, Donald Eastlake uh, has become what was uh, the remaining chair of uh, the Babel Working Group, is now also a, a, a chair of Monet. You might think that the ADs were maybe getting a bit ahead of themselves, but uh, maybe not. These are a few of the remaining documents. And these are about the second function of this DLAP protocol. The first function of DLAP is to let the radio inform the router about the status of the links and the destinations it can reach. But the secondary function is that DLAP can also uh, flow control the router because the bit of ethernet between the router and the radio would allow the router to completely overwhelm uh, the radios, uh, which uh, operate uh, at one or two uh, orders of magnitude uh, lower uh, uh, link capacities. And usually the, the capacity of those links is shared I mean, among all uh, nodes in the network. Um, these uh, graphs have been, for all kinds of reasons, been languishing much too long in the working group, uh, but now we uh, really want to really get them out the door so that we can start with a clean slate for the new charter. There are also some things, some new individual, or not new, but some individual uh, ideas that we want to uh, run an adoption call on. There will be a um, DLAP maintenance and extension uh, work item on the new charter. So they would fit there. So we don't have those to finish those immediately. Um, the idea about this, uh, about these drafts is that they um, can be used in case you don't have anything better. Um, DLAP only specifies the exchanges between uh, uh, routers, routers and uh, locally attached radios. Um, they say nothing about how the radios obtain the information that they base the content of the DLAP messages on. That's, uh, that's outside the scope. But sometimes the link capacity is so low that there's really uh, not much room for signaling among uh, radios to inform them each other about the uh, link state and destination state. And then uh, mm -hmm. these physical layer parameters like a signal to noise ratio or link quality uh, can be helpful. So we want to uh, have these as uh, additional uh, DLAP extensions. And then there was uh, one uh, new uh, ID, individual uh, ID, presented yesterday about uh, sloppy topology updates uh, that could uh, serve the purpose of uh, energy preservation in uh, battery-operated uh, devices. And we have to see whether we take that on in the new charter. It's not covered by the current charter. 
it could be take the form of a of a new rot routing protocol, or it could result in um, changes to the existing routing protocols. For instance, uh, OLSR v2 or Babel. But there was a lot of comments. And there is also all some discussion on the mailing list already. So um, I think the authors have to do some work before we go can go to an adoption call, if at all. Um, things that we have achieved and not achieved uh, from the current charter. Obviously, we developed the dealer protocol. We did the uh, flow control extension. That's nearly done. Um, there was another idea to use traffic classification to generate statistics. That was never really uh, that never really materialized. We were going to do mod some work on uh, multicast, maybe extending uh, the simplified multicast forwarding um, mechanism. RFC sixty six twenty one, which is an experimental RFC that was never a, a proposed uh, standard, um, but somehow nobody picked that up. And there was uh, another thing um, to document uh, best practices and challenges for deploying and managing uh, Monet networks. But um, we came to the conclusion that uh, nobody is very keen on uh, making public how they do this. So uh, that also uh, did not happen. Then there's an implicit uh, uh, work item to to keep maintaining OLSR v2 and its supporting protocols. Um, Adrian was AD uh, during the time that uh, all this was uh, was developed. So you must uh, still remember that. Um, there are some um, RFCs that have experimental status, like the directional airtime metric. That's, uh, and in practice, that's the only metric that's being used uh, in uh, existing implementations of OLS RV2. So maybe we should uh, standardize that. And if somebody thinks that's not a good idea, then I'd like to hear about uh, alternatives to the, uh, to the that metric. And there's also a multi-topology extension that uh, could potentially also be taken to proposed standard from its current state of being experimental. Um, as I said, DLAP maintenance extensions, Babel maintenance and extensions, that, those are no-brainers. They will end up in, on the new charter. And there is a whole list of things that we could potentially do, but uh, that, we, that are for further discussion. Uh, and this discussion has to start, be started on the mailing list and then uh, um, continued in, the, in an interim meeting. Um, yeah. We have been, uh, last year in Philadelphia, we had a combined uh, session from uh, Roll, Manet, and, and Babel. Babel was still alive, of course, too, at that time. Um, and we have to see if there's anything from that session that we can, uh, with regard to multicast, that we can continue uh, on the new charter. Maybe uh, 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 an approach uh, inspired by the beer protocol, although it will not be literally be the beer protocol, uh, because that is not a good fit for uh, mobile adult networks, we think. A reactive protocol, we have tried it in the past. It was a bit of a drama. That's also something that Adrian will remember. And um, yeah, if, if there's really energy from some participants uh, in the working group to pick that up, we, I cannot rule it out uh, right now, but I think it's unlikely that we will do that. And then, um, 
So these slides were not presented yesterday, but I'm presenting them now to potentially a wider audience. So the last bullet is uh, if anybody has ideas that we can pick up, uh, I'd like to hear them. We, the chairs, would like to hear them. And one thing I forgot to mention on this slide is that uh, apparently there was uh, something about satellite networking yesterday in the routing working group. And um, I wasn't there. I have to go see what it was about. I have been warned that uh, uh, somebody is going to approach us to talk about this. And of course, they're, they're welcome. And that's it. Any questions? Any questions about the picture? No, I think I think we're good. Ron. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Ed Borain. I am the co-chair of the TVR Working Group, along with uh, Tony Lee. Uh, Tony is the smarter co-chair because he told me to present now. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, I, one of the things that seems self-evident in retrospect when we talk about what our working group is supposed to be doing is to talk about the charter of the working group. Uh, but we didn't have a slide for that at first. So before we jump into the milestones, let me give you a little bit of a, an oral history of how this came to be, what our charter is, then that will explain what some of the milestones are. Uh, at IETF 115, uh, we started having conversations uh, related to uh, the question, what happens if we know in advance that we will have an adjacency that is going to uh, come uh, up or go away, and how do we uh, plan for that? Uh, this is different than MENA, where it would be ad hoc, uh, but what if we know in advance uh, that we're gonna do a recovery or an acquisition or a loss, and how do we do that? And of course, we know that there are individual systems that react to this and make it part of their planning, but how do we standardize that? And what would it look like if we were to put schedule information into a RIB or schedule information into a FIB? Would it benefit uh, our our operations and could we do this in a standard way? Uh, from there, we had a BOF uh, in, in London uh, and that went uh, very well. It was very well attended. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a lot of interest from the community and then from there, uh, we had our very first meeting. Uh, this is 117. So we were just had our very first meeting at 116 and we're about to have our second meeting tomorrow. So uh, we're not going to go deeply into some of the technical work right now because we're going into our second meeting. But if you're interested in it, come to the working group tomorrow and, and you'll get as much of that as you'd like. So when we decided to charter or when the working group was decided to be formed and we put the charter in, uh, what we wanted to make sure that we captured was what were the interesting use cases where we would have this kind of planned change to the topology of the network in a way that we could react to. Uh, one, of the, one of the more sort of driving use cases, of course, is mobility. If we understand the mobility of a device or the mobility of the obstacles to that device, then we could sort of plan when things would come and go. But additionally, if we started looking at cases where we would turn off our network interfaces to save power or turn off our network interfaces or turn on our network interfaces to save uh, cost or transmit or some other sorts of metrics, then uh, all of those became sort of interesting cases. So we are chartered generally to look at what would schedule information look like? What is the information model associated with that? Who would use it for what purposes? And then what are the requirements therein? Uh, and then at sort of the end of the, this initial chartering of the working group is to produce those information models with the hope that we would then be able to provide those to other working groups in the routing area and elsewhere to say, how would we incorporate this information into the routing protocols uh, for others? So that's a little bit of the history and the charter for the working group. Uh, the way that that has been decomposed into a series of milestones is to start with what is the problem statement and what are the use cases? And so we do have our you know, sort of first uh, adopted document, which are what are the use cases for this? That's been interesting because 
there are categories of use cases, you know, categories for resource, resource preservation or mobility or uh, cost metrics. And we have gotten into some pretty good mailing list discussions as to what represent new and different and motivating uses and categories of that information versus what are just two or three instances of essentially the same problem. So we're trying to make sure that we don't have a use case explosion in, in the work that we are doing, but separately make sure that we have all of the truly unique driving cases captured in that document. Uh, as we are progressing uh, with that, uh, we now have uh, an initial, uh, initial draft associated with what are the requirements for scheduling information and the requirements for the information that is captured with enough utility and, and annotative information to make them useful. And then beyond that, what are the information models and then the data models and how might we apply them? And then what are some overall considerations? What we are not doing in the working group is creating a new routing protocol. Uh, we are not trying to explain to other routing protocols what they should or should not be doing. We are trying to make sure that we put together the reason and the rationale for considering time, what considering time means, what are some of the common definitions, and where it could be applicable to others. It's a long first slide. Uh, so if you were to come to the working group uh, in tomorrow, uh, this is a, a walkthrough of what that agenda looks like. Uh, we are going to be giving a, a small update to the use case document. It's on a dash 01 or dash 02 revision. Uh, we are trying again to enumerate the classes uh, that we are talking through. And then we have two different, we have two different uh, requirements documents and we're gonna sort of look through uh, each of those and try and understand whether we can merge them. Uh, and then we have a couple of different Yang models to capture some of our information. Uh, the first two, uh, this one, DraftQ TVR Schedule Yang, uh, is a cut at sort of a link schedule from one particular approach. And then the second one, um, which is uh, Draft Kinsey TVR Link Availability, is a second. What we've actually been able to do uh, is, is talk to each of those authors and say, there's enough commonality here. Would you be amenable to merging into a, a single model uh, for link scheduling and availability? The authors are open to that. And one of the things we're going to present, uh, which is a little bit late breaking to this, is sort of their, their plan forward for here is our individual model, and here's how we're going to uh, try to bring them together under, under one document. Uh, we are uh, still uh, talking through and, and open to some of the information that we're getting from Alto. Uh, and then we have a uh, presentation from Mark Blanchet on, on contact planning, which is the idea of if we have contacts in the future for, for what, what they would consider contact graph routing, uh, then what would that data model look like? Uh, and then generally some, some other routing considerations. So there's, there's a bit of a... There's a bit of a, a movement in a couple of, or in all directions associated with use cases, requirements, and data models. And uh, it's been pretty good. So when we, we look back and say, as we go into and look at our second meeting, uh, we wanted to uh, evaluate what do we think is going well and what are the things that we wanna watch out for. We had about 90 some people at the first meeting. We'll see uh, how many uh, you know, come to the second meeting. There's always uh, sort of that initial interest, but what we, what has been going well is that even though we had you know, a very large interest and a large number of people coming in, we've been able to get to a series of motivated authors that are willing to write drafts. Uh, in, in fact, as we have put out requests for this, there, there have been uh, sort of typically more requests to present and more requests for, for editing than, than we have time to present during the working group, which is of course you know, a, a reasonably nice place to be. And the authors have written large and good drafts in a reasonably short amount of time. So the motivation is there. Uh, the mailing list has generally been responsive when information has been posted. We seem to be on schedule for the milestones that we have. And uh, by and large, the uh, discussions have been open and polite. So when we look at how is the working group going right now, uh, unlike the prior two presentations, I don't want to go deeply into the technical work. We really are looking at what does this look like from building a community around time variance and how we bring schedules in. That has been our primary goal because there is a lot of different, uh, there are differences in how we use time. 
whether we should be tracking time, whether we can standardize a common solution for time, or whether uh, these are things people don't want to talk about openly, and uh, the extent to which we would want to infuse time and schedule information into existing routing protocols. So getting a community where we have motivated authors uh, coming forward, where we are responsive to the mailing list, where we are getting open and polite discussion, tells me that we're starting to get the exchange of ideas that will help make sure that we're not pushing into a particular direction that will be harder to, to infuse into other areas. Uh, there are a couple of things that we are trying to pay attention to to make sure that we, we keep that positive momentum. Uh, we do see a couple of different competing drafts. We have two requirements documents. We had two Yang models for links. Uh, like we said, we were able to get the editors for the two Yang models to talk about combining, and, and that has been good. I think we'll wind up in a similar position for requirements. Uh, we really want to make sure that we keep our focus on planned schedules. Again, this is not ad hoc. This is not MENE. We have a working group for that. So it comes up periodically. What do we do with opportunistic? How do we deal with things that go away when we don't expect it? And we're trying as best as possible to say that's really not the problem we're trying to solve at this time. Uh, there, there are a large number of uh, questions as opposed and approaches that we're being asked to consider. We just want to make sure that all of them are being heard initially as we start doing this initial filtering and conversion onto uh, the solutions that the working group is behind. And the last one, which is sort of one of the more important as we look to transport protocols and the transport area, is there's a natural question that comes up that says, if I don't have a link now, but I believe that I will have a link later. What do I do with that information? And one of the things, of course, that you can do with that information is say, I will keep some of my information around until I have that future link. And a standard way to do that from the transport area is to use the bundle protocol. However, that does not mean that there is now a one-to-one a -one mapping between schedule information and the use of things like DTN or the bundle protocol. It's useful in some cases, it is not useful in other cases. So we wanna make sure that this working group is not perceived as focusing only on a particular satellite use case or space use case or Leo constellation use case. And we wanna make sure that the working group is also not perceived as focusing solely on time varying information because of the bundle protocol. It's an important use case, but it's not the only one. And the work that we do really just has to be appropriately generalized. So that's really all we have in terms of trying to describe a little bit about where we are with time variant routing. We're making pretty good progress. We're progressing against our milestones. If you're interested in the technical work, please join the working group. Please join the mailing list and, and make your opinions heard. And we're about to go into meeting number two. And I see a question. Yeah, just um, thank you very much. Um, this is kind of a strange question wearing no particular hats. Um, recently, we've been doing some work in the ITU with regards to COP28, and they're looking at efficiency stuff and, you know, sustainability and a lot of it to do with energy, etc. And they're effectively collating work that they can look at it to include in the stuff that they're doing um, in COP28. And I just wondered if you thought that there could be work from TVR that I could point them to and say, you know, this is also happening in the IETF. Um, thoughts on that? So uh, I'll, I'll start and, and say one of the things that we were hoping would happen is that if we were able to appropriately put a use case document together to say these are all of the reasons why we might care about schedule information and the different ways that that would manifest, that that would be the starting point. So if, if folks were saying, is there something being done or is there a driver for TVR that looks like a driver for something else, I would start with having them look at the use case document and see whether they see their use cases represented in here. And I think the answer is yes. Lou Berger, it's really funny you talk, You brought that question up. On Saturday, I had a nice long discussion about how the, uh, the work that's going on with the characterizing links could not only be used to predict future, but also might be able to be augmented to uh, track power consumption in the past and then be 
further than used by a controller group to, uh, to bring in some policies of how you, how you might want to modify the routing system to do things in the future. So I fully am on, on board with what you're talking about. Yeah, so th thanks so much. I do, but what I think I'm going to do is also just go through those documents and then I will drop them into the relevant channels on the, on the Slack where they're dealing with COP28 um, and, you know, point them to it and see where it goes. Yeah, yeah much appreciated. But otherwise, that's, that's TVR. It's, it's about time. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then um, that is the end of our scheduled business. If anybody has any other business you want to bring up, now's the time. Charge the mic or put yourself in queue. Otherwise, we are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody.